All right, we got SCP-073 and 076K versus Abel. We actually heard some of this from the Exploring series, but it's always nice to see it animated, and everybody got their own sauce and dripped the SCP, so we're going to see what it's talking about. Um, so, yeah, bro, let's go ahead and uh, check this out. Corpses littered the facility, around 20 in total. Their massacre had unfolded in a matter of seconds, despite their advanced armor and heavy weaponry. Their killer, wielding an ancient sword he'd somehow pulled from thin air, looked upon them with disdain. Weak. He said, look at my message about Tokoyami. Sorry for the people on YouTube. I know y'all just looking forward to the SCP videos. But Tokoyami has a bird head because his parents had bird quirks, and he had took that look from his parents, but it don't give him any powers. Oh... So his dark shadow is, okay. To be honest, I don't think there's worse quirks I could think of. Any quirk, okay. Sorry, y'all, uh, people who, y'all don't know what we're talking about. We just finished watching a My Hero video, and we were, like, on Reddit and stuff. So make sure y'all come over to Twitch side so you can know exactly what we're talking about. Twitch backslash Isaiah Cozy. You know what I mean? Join the Discord. Y'all might as well. And if you haven't liked the video, just go ahead and like it. But let's go ahead and uh, hop right back into this video. Unworthy opponents. He breathed heavily. His torso was covered with bullet wounds, and many had punctured his lungs. It was enough to kill a normal man ten times over, but not him. He was the ultimate warrior, the perfect killing machine. He would need to seek out an enemy more fitting for his legendary combat skills. He fled from the chamber into a connecting hallway, where a giant metal door slammed shut behind him. At the other end of a hall, another door did the same. He laughed at the thought of someone thinking he could be trapped so easily and charged towards it. But then, large valves began to open all around him. Torrents of freezing seawater began pouring in, filling up the chamber and submerging him before he could reach the door. The warrior fought for breath, and he held it far longer than any mortal man could, especially considering the state of his lungs. But water always wins. He soon gave his last gasp and floated, lifeless in the hallway. And soon after, his body turned to dust and disappeared in the briny water. But he would be back. He'd always be back. His brother was a different story. Tall and handsome with a strange... Oh, wait. Is, so, are they just going to explain, like, Cain and Abel? Like, we know these SCPs. I, I was thinking this was just going to be, like, the pure... Maybe he just explained... They're explaining off the rip. Okay. Marion Rune tattooed on his forehead. He was practically a pacifist and spent most of his days reading conversing with the staff and wandering the facility of his own accord. Upon hearing of the latest incident at the facility, he gave a sigh. He knew on some level that all of this was his fault. It'd been centuries, millennia even, but was it too late to make things right? Six days later, the two are standing face to face. This meeting had been a long time coming, but it was always destined to end in blood and pain. The man with the runic tattoo was unarmed, the only thing he carried was his regrets. The warrior, eyes full of burning fury, drew his sword. And not long after, a head hit the floor. Who are these two strange men? And what is the significance of this fatal meeting? In our own universe, these two may never meet again. But that doesn't mean there isn't a universe out there where they will. And it is that universe where today's tale springs from. The story between these two began a long, long time ago when they were both set on a course of destruction. But to learn how these two finally met once again, we only need to go back a few days. While they seem more human than a lot of beings under the SCP Foundation's watchful eyes, there's no doubt that these two are anomalous. They're known as SCP-073 and SCP-076, but better known as Cain and Abel. From the name alone, most people with a basic knowledge of the Bible could tell that these two have a connection but the particulars were largely a mystery to the Foundation. They wanted to know how much of the story was actually true. SCP researchers approached SCP-073, aka Kane, and asked if he'd be interested in reuniting with his brother one last time. It took Kane three days to answer. Yes, but on one condition, that he was the only person who could abort the mission. The Foundation mulled over this requirement for three- Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why I got this O5 council member up in this frame right here. Didn't he get disappeared? Ain't somebody come in here and say, out of there, boy. Three days before the O5 council finally made a decision. Cross-testing approved. These two brothers, separated by millennia, would finally meet again. 
and the SCP Foundation would get to watch what happened when they did. Of course, for safety reasons, the cross-test would take place in 076's containment facility, a bedrock chamber 200 meters beneath the sea. That would be the closest thing to safe this fateful meeting could ever be. Though safe was really a relative term when it came to SCP-076. His escape attempts were as frequent <laughs> and so devious, bro? as they Relax. were deadly, and everyone who'd ever worked with him knew exactly why. To the untrained eye, it would seem strange to create such a complex facility for a 3 meter squared stone cube, known as SCP-076-01. But the cube isn't what's being locked up here. The real danger comes from the corpse stored inside, known as SCP-076-02, but better known as Abel. He's a lean, olive-skinned man who appears to be in his late tw I don't understand their explanation. I feel like they just tiptoed around a lot and gave like little mini details, and now they're introducing the kid. Like, I, is this meeting only like two minutes? Because we haven't even talked about Kane. Like, because I, I already know. I don't want to skip for people who's the first time watching this. I don't want to skip, and I know some people already know about Kane Abel, and they're probably like, "Oh, cozy." Like, we already know. Like. I know, but I just, y'all just gonna have to bear with it at this point. Just, just cause I, the explanation kind of weird, just to me, like the way it is. But that, that's only cause I know about King Abel. For those who don't know King Abel, it, it makes sense. But the, the title was King vs. Abel, so I thought that was all this was. 20s. But is, do you still watch the rubber? I already posted this new thing on my channel. It's already up. His most distinct physical feature is the fact he's covered in an elaborate network of arcane and occult tattoos, largely of scowling demonic faces, similar to those found on members of the Yakuza. Whenever Abel's corpse reanimates, as it does at random intervals, everyone in his vicinity is in terrible danger. He's capable of pulling bladed weapons out of miniature dimensional rifts that appear around him, though he does this so quickly that it seems as though the weapons are simply materializing in his hands. Despite the increasingly complex efforts to contain him, Abel has been able to Yakuza is like a famous gang in uh in Japan. You never played Yakuza the game? Or you never seen it before, bro? Reach containment and go on brutal rampages multiple times, killing scores of Foundation personnel in the process. Abel possesses superhuman strength, speed, and durability. During prior containment breaches, he was able to shrug off rounds from 50 caliber machine guns. He's torn through reinforced steel doors. He's even swatted bullets from both handguns and assault rifles out of the air with a length of steel rebar. Only killing him can truly end one of these rampages, and the Foundation has had to go to terrifying lengths in order to achieve this during past containment breaches. He's been drowned, asphyxiated, crushed, burned to death with a thermite grenade directly inserted into his chest cavity, and even disintegrated by the activation of the facility's on-site nuclear warhead. This may seem like overkill, but if Abel were ever to make his way into a major population center, the fatalities would be, well, of biblical proportions. Even death can't keep him down for long. His body will rapidly decompose and reappear intact within SCP-076-01. There's no telling when he'll reawaken, and his periods of inactivity can range from hours to years. Because of this, he must be constantly observed by guards highly proficient in close combat. This is why the SCP will never, ever truly exist, because you got niggas like Abe running around, and then you got a bunch of like the mainstream anomalies in 176-106. 096 like you got all those 049 like you there's no way you contain it all them bro how much personnel do they have bro the scp foundation would have to have millions of personnel bro literally and if they do well so be it but you know they would need a major staff and always ready to go toe to toe with perhaps the most dangerous melee combatant in history he's such a proficient killer that there was once a project aimed at weaponizing abel but this turned out to be a disastrous failure for the Foundation. When they ran out of missions to give him, Abel's thirst for blood caused him to turn his blade on his allies with no remorse, hacking them up with the same ruthless abandon he gave his assigned enemies. Interestingly, Abel does seem to have a twisted sense of honor. He has respect for combatants capable of providing him with a real challenge, and has even expressed concern for guards he considers to be respectable adversaries. But don't be fooled. There is no reasoning with Abel. Either you kill him, or he kills you. And trust us, he's much better at it than you are. 
While he's often overshadowed by world-ending anomalies or more talkative mass killers like SCP-682, Abel is one of the most deadly creatures known to the Foundation. Abel's counterpart, 073, is an entirely different story. Despite his namesake being the first biblical murderer, this Cain is a far more enigmatic figure. A tall man in his early 30s appearing to be of Middle Eastern descent, he has two very notable physical characteristics. The untranslated Sumerian symbol tattooed on his forehead, and the fact that several of his body parts, namely his arms, legs, spinal cord, and shoulder blades, have been replaced by mysterious prosthetics of unknown origin. Unlike Abel, Cain is polite, non-confrontational, articulate, and communicative. He's even allowed to wander the facility he's housed in freely, though with certain regulations. Namely, that Cain is never permitted to come into contact with plant life or uncovered ground. This is because, in spite of the fact Cain doesn't appear to harbor any malicious intent, direct contact with him causes plants to wither and die, and the ground to become infertile. If Cain was ever introduced into a natural environment again, he could unwittingly cause an ecological catastrophe with his mere presence. In that sense, he could almost be as dangerous to large populations as Abel. However, Cain's danger to flora is only one of his several anomalous <laughs> qualities, another is extraordinary mental capabilities and a near-perfect memory. His memory and ability to recall is so good that some Foundation personnel have suggested using Kane's mind as a kind of backup server for the Foundation's collective knowledge. But perhaps his most well-known anomalous trait is his ability to act as a kind of immortal human voodoo doll. That's right. Any damage inflicted on Kane causes no permanent injury to him and is reflected back on the perpetrator. While Kane has remarked on still being able to okay? feel the pain wow. of his assaults, He's functionally immortal. This damage reflecting ability has even made performing certain kinds of tests impossible, as doctors attempting to draw blood from Kane have found that their sample was actually their own blood, and their skin exhibited the telltale bruising and puncture marks of blood testing. But of most interest to the Foundation right now was the fact that Kane has shown prior knowledge of Abel. However, he was cagey when questioned. He refused to add any additional information and commented that it would be best if he and Abel were never brought into contact. But what does never really mean when you live forever? Cain finally did agree to the test. And while nobody knew what caused Cain's change of heart, the Foundation knew better than to push him and potentially get the entire mission scrapped. Cain was taken from his facility and transported to the access point of Abel's underwater prison. The experiment's design was simple. Kane would occupy a temporary residence in Abel's containment facility until he next reanimated, at which point the interaction between them would be closely observed. Perhaps it would take weeks, months, or even years before Abel once again awoke and left his cube. But when he did, Kane would be there. Thankfully, as Kane whispered soothing words into Abel's tomb, the resurrection took only minutes. If you were expecting a heartwarming he said, my brother, <laughs> my brother, come out reunion. Think again. Kane tried to apologize, but Abel immediately struck him with a decapitating blow, which, due to Kane's damage reflecting properties, caused him to sever his own head instead. Kane remained at Abel's side as he regenerated, and as soon as Abel did, he immediately tried killing Kane again. It went on like this again and again and again. It was an arduous process, and eventually, even Abel began to tire of it. The duo fell into a tearful embrace. Abel asked his brother why he killed him so long ago, and Cain apologized, saying it was the actions of a younger and more foolish man. In that moment, the two finally reconciled, and having fulfilled their bargain with their creator, both finally crumbled into dust. Peace man. at last. Isn't As we said, this didn't happen to the Cain and Abel of our universe, but when universes are more numerous than grains of sand in an endless desert, such a thing has indeed happened somewhere out there, perhaps in a kinder universe than our own. We can only hope that Cain and Abel may someday get to meet and find the same resolution. But until then, these brothers will remain one of the most dangerous and fascinating duos in the Foundation's catalog. Now go check out SCP-087. I mean, bro, like, they both crumbled into dust and thus being released from everything. I mean... I guess, bro. I guess. I don't... Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was fire. 
Ugh. So, shout out the infographics team always doing their thing. You know what I mean? 